how unfortunate it would be if the way the world is put together, that we are not the authors of our lives. A free will is a will of our own free making, and we must have made it somehow by past actions in which we formed our own character. I argue that Aristotle had this idea himself. He said, if a man is responsible for the wicked acts that flow from his character, he must at some time in the past have been responsible for forming the wicked character from which these acts flow. And that, that's really what I mean by ultimate responsibility, that uh, there would be sometime in the past that there were actions that were not determined at that time by things that went before in which you formed your will and that would mean you could go in different directions that you could have acted differently at that time and you were not determined to act i call them self-forming actions the self-forming actions arise at those difficult times in life when we are torn between uh, different things that we want to hold and can't at the same time. Perhaps we're torn, for example, between doing the moral thing and acting from ambition. Uh, or we are torn between uh, doing something we really don't want to do because we have a terrible aversion to doing it. We have to embolden ourselves uh, to do it. Or perhaps we're torn between a short-term satisfaction and long-term goals, holding my marriage together so I don't fall to temptation. At such times, the tension and uncertainty about what to do that we feel in our minds uh, would be reflected in some indeterminacy in our neural processes themselves. It would be like the mind would be agitated by the very conflict that we would feel uh, in our will so that the experienced uncertainty would correspond to the opening, the physical opening of a window of opportunity uh, that temporarily screens off complete determination by our past, and then its different paths are going to be uh, open to us. Whichever choice is made is going to require an effort of will on our part to resist the temptation to make the other choice, because both of them are things that we really want. In short, I'm postulating a form of parallel processing in the free decision-making brain. I often use an example of a, a businesswoman uh, who's going to a meeting very important to her career uh, when she sees an assault taking place in an alley. So she feels her moral self tells her that she should stop and at least call for the police, alert other people, do something. But on the other hand, this is a very important meeting to her career and she's imagining her boss, what's he gonna say if she's late and uh, she may lose this important sale and so she's deeply torn. Well, that's an SFA. She is immediately thrown into this deliberative state. And because the indeterminacy has been stirred up by the conflict of her will, uh, and it's the reason why there has to be, it's not certain which one is going to succeed. Uh, whichever one succeeds, I say, is going to be her choice. And it, since it resulted from her effort, which was purposeful and had the very purpose of getting to that effort, and its input was the reasons for that, her moral motives, it's going to be her choice. It wasn't determined. She might have failed to make it. Uh, but it's going to be her choice. And that's going to be true whichever one she finally settles on, even though it's undetermined right up to the moment which one is it's going to be. One of the major objections about my tool efforts is it's irrational to make two efforts at the same time with contradictory or incompatible ends. And my answer to that is it usually is irrational to do that in ordinary life because in ordinary life when we make efforts we are usually we have usually set our will on doing something we want to do uh, and we have to make an effort to to do it 
So we have decided to open the door, but we find that the door is stuck, so we have to make it to open, make an effort to open it. And in that case, it would be irrational to make dual efforts. It would make no sense uh, in those situations. I call those will-settled situations um, because our will is already set on one way on doing what we want to do. But I claim there are certain situations uh, in which it is reasonable to make two efforts. And these are situations which I call will setting. These are situations in which we want to do more than one thing, uh, cannot do both, uh, that um, our will is not yet set on doing either one of them, but we want to set it in some way. So we make efforts in both directions and uh, one of them is going to win. And so at the moment we do it, we set our will in one direction or another when it was not already set. You know, uh, Daniel Dennett, he used this wonderful example of Martin Luther, who when he finally broke with the church from Rome, said, here I stand, I can do no other. And Dennett, who's a compatibilist, says, suppose uh, Luther was literally right. At that moment, he'd come to a certain point where he had to uh, uh, break with Rome. Um, does this mean he was not free and was not responsible for his action? Uh, no. And I agree with him. It, it, uh, this was probably the most responsible act of Luther's life. But what I respond to Dennett is, that's true, Dan, but the real question here is that Luther is responsible for this because by many, many acts in his past, he has slowly brought himself to this point where he could do no other than do this. And we know if we looked at the, at the biography of, of Luther's life, how many struggles he went through here. He was, after all, a cleric and committed to the church, and, and he thought about breaking and doing this, and he struggled with this. And finally, yeah, he got to the point where this was the right thing to do that was determined by his will and, and the most responsible act of his life, but that's because he'd made himself the way he is. With the randomness involved in self-forming actions, Cain shows how we can form our own wills out of a past that was not entirely predetermined. But the randomness is still a problem for many, who remain unconvinced that it allows us to be ultimately responsible for what we do. I mean, I think Bob Cain's attempt to describe what it would take to be self-determining in the way that could make you genuinely responsible. It's like the best I've seen, <laughs> but I just don't think it can work because one of the points is that at a crucial point he says, so he takes his self-forming action. That's an action that's preceded by probably a difficult moral choice or something like that. And there's lots of intense, shall I, shall, shall I or shan't I? And at that point he thinks that something indeterministic must happen, something in, in, the, in, the, in the scientific sense. What is it going to be? Suppose it's going to be some gamma ray from somewhere that strikes your brain and makes you do differently. Well, that doesn't make you responsible for it, so indeterminism can't help. That's the idea. This is the main objection against libertarian free will. If we do have some choices that were undetermined, and even if we can have some control over them, why does that make us responsible? If you think about it, you will realize that the indeterminism, it's not functioning as a cause on its own. It isn't that the indeterminism is causing the choices or anything. The goal of the purpose is realized despite the indeterminism. Uh, so it lowers the probability that either one of these choices will be made and it's stirred up, of course, by the conflict. But for each of them, it makes it uncertain that it will succeed, which means it lowers the probability. If there were no indeterminism, then maybe one of these things would go automatically right through. We'd have no reason to do otherwise. But the indeterminism makes it uncertain whether the outcome is going to occur. So it lowers the probability of the outcome. Well, uh, something which plays a causal, it has a causal influence on what happens, but lowers the probability is not the cause of the result. 
uh, like a vaccination, for example, lowers the probability of getting a disease. But if you get the disease anyway, uh, the vaccination isn't the cause, even though it's causally relevant. Uh, the causes is the infecting virus, which raised the probability. Well, in the case of each of these efforts of will that this businesswoman is making, what's raising the probability that one of these choices will be made is the motives that she has to be a moral person. She thinks of her mother, what would my mother think, you know? And, and over here, she's thinking, what will my boss think? Uh, and uh, and uh, these are the motives that ultimately will make one of them prevail. Uh, and so they are the causes. Your choices, your motives, and your reasons. The indeterminism is involved like the vaccination, but it's not the cause, it's an inhibiting factor. So we don't have to get into, well, chance caused it or indeterminism caused it. No, no, what caused it was the motives and the deliberative efforts and the reasoning of the agent that caused it to come about. Um, could it have caused the other one? Well, yeah, but it didn't cause this one, despite the indeterminism. And this is gonna be true whichever one uh, is made. And so we can say it's the agent is who's the cause. Chance is not the cause. The agent is the cause. I sometimes give an example of this, of a husband arguing with his wife. And in, in uh, his anger, he swings his arm down on her favorite glass tabletop, trying to break it. Uh, and uh, uh, let's say there's some indeterminism in his neural networks here, which make the momentum of his arm indeterminate. So it's literally undetermined at the very moment of striking whether it's going to break or not. And yet he's making an effort to break it. And let's say it breaks. Uh, well, it was undetermined that the table broke. It was a matter of chance, really. Uh, but it's not going to be a very good excuse for him to say to his wife, chance broke the table, not me. <laughs> It's funny that it, chance does diminish our control of things. But even when it does, it doesn't diminish our responsibility. Kane argues that if we commit to our decision, knowing that there's some chance involved, then that makes us responsible for it, whichever way we go. But even so, even if we grant responsibility for undetermined choices, why isn't our choice, in the end, just arbitrary? Bob goes right up to the point, even if at the end of the whole set of deliberations, if the last step involves indeterminism, and if I am cognizant of my use of that indeterminism in going forward, because I don't have enough evidence to do this or that, so I I, I accept the fact that whichever way I go, I will take responsibility for either way. Bob Kane has established that we can ha take responsibility for flipping the coin. And every time I say to Bob Kane that uh, we, we might be flipping a coin, he says, don't go there. No, I'm not talking about flipping coins. This is the one thing about these choices that I think is right, that they are arbitrary in this sense, but you have to understand, you have to interpret arbitrary this way in the sense that you do not have conclusive or decisive reasons for choosing what you choose, but you have good reasons. To say they're not conclusive or decisive is to say that you also had reasons for an alternative choice, but you didn't go with them. Uh, so they are not decisive or conclusive reasons. Uh, decision theorists have a term, I forget who the decision theorist was invented this term, called satisficing that reasons that they're not conclusive, they're not decisive, but they're satisficing, they're good enough. They're good enough to allow you to say, yeah, that would be okay, that would be okay. Um, and, uh, and so they are satisficing reasons, they're not conclusive. In that sense, they're arbitrary. Uh, and me, people say, well, it's, it's sort of, then your choice is just arbitrary. But no, because the ordinary uses of arbitrary means that they weren't reasoned, they weren't thought out, they weren't good choices. They would just flip a coin type thing. And that's not what we have here at all. Uh, I say, for example, the old liberty of indifference of the Middle Ages was uh, the donkey's between two bales of hay, and he's indifferent to which one. Either one will do. He should flip a coin then. Uh, in my self-forming actions, uh, choices and so on, uh, it's, 
It's not that you're indifferent to the outcomes. It's not that you care too little about whichever one will do. You care too much about both of them. Uh, and that's very different. That's very, very different because your life's on the line here. And I say, I often liken this to the fact that the medieval designation for free will was liberum arbitrium voluntaris. It's the title of uh, Augustine's famous work. It doesn't mean on the free choice of the will, it's often translated. On the free judgment of the will, arbitrium means judgment. And what we mean by arbitrary here is we make a judgment that's not guaranteed to be the only right one, but it's our judgment. In this sense, it's arbitrary. But this sense of arbitrary, so far from being an objection, tells us something very, very important about free will. Namely, it tells us uh, that we must choose without uh, conclusive reasons frequently in life. But the thing is, we are committing ourselves to it, and that's why we're responsible. Imagine a novelist writing a novel in which the heroine faces a crisis and he hasn't really developed her character sufficiently enough to say how she will react in this crisis situation. So he has to make a judgment about which way she will go. And so he makes this judgment uh, and has her go in one direction. It wasn't determined by her past life and her motives and character up to then but it was consistent with it. And he could have made her go in a different direction here, which would have also uh, been consistent with it. So he makes a judgment and will now determine where her life will subsequently go, down which of these garden paths. Um, and, uh, and that's the idea then of, of judgment. A free choice is a judgment. And it's one done with less than perfect information. But that's life. I, I, like the writer of this novel, I am both a writer and a character in my own novel all at once. So if our life is really like a garden of forking paths, one that we are writing as we go along, then the paths that present themselves don't just randomly appear. They're consistent with our story up to now. But even so, once we're at the fork, even if every path is one which is rational and one we can take responsibility for, why isn't it, in the end, just a matter of pure chance that we go down one path or another? So in the actual world, a man decides to do one thing, and then we do a little rollback in time and we play it forward and we don't change anything. It's all replay now, up until the moment of decision and he makes the other decision. Yeah, I think the difference there is a difference in chance and nothing more. And there I say, it's a mistake to look at a single decision by a single person and a single alternative and draw conclusions just from that. It's, it's tunnel vision. What you have to do is look at a person over the course of time, over the course of the person's life so far. The way I think about it is, imagine that there is a little bit of chance in this decision-making system. Um, does the chance take over? No, in fact, we can modify it. We can modify these chances. So if you think about decision-making as being like the toss of dice, well, the next toss, how it turns out, doesn't depend at all on how the earlier one turned out. The tosses are independent of each other. The results are independent. But later decisions do seem to depend to some degree on earlier decisions. And then what you want to know is, okay, if I work like that, how can I make things go as well as they possibly can? And there the answer is you work on your character so that the chance of doing things you think you shouldn't do and deciding to do them gets really tiny. And the chance of making good decisions gets larger and larger. So maybe, you know, as we progress, as we become more firm in our characters and so on, there's less of a role for luck to play. Ultimate responsibility accumulates over time. It starts in young childhood, uh, I think three, four and so on, when children begin to 
hesitate, and, but it accumulates over time and we become more responsible. This is where I agree with Aristotle again. We build our character over time and we form and reform it over time. If libertarian free will is possible, then people can have the kind of freedom they intuitively think is already theirs. But its foundations have many weak points. And if any one of them turns out to be false, then this kind of free will is simply impossible. You really need the indeterminism in nature, let's face it. I, I always like to say this, look, if you're going to try to reconcile your philosophical theories with science, instead of just going off forever, if you're going to try to do that, then you're going to have to take your chances with science. Neuroscience is going to tell us more and more about that brain, and it, every day it's wonderful discoveries, and whether it will get down to the nub of where you need to be in order to decide whether quantum physics has anything to do with it is a long way down compared to what we're seeing looking into the brain with the tools of modern uh, brain imaging. Some things seem clear. There's parallel processing in the brain. Uh, Quantum theory seems to be, by majority, uh, indeterministic. That the brain uh, is a nonlinear thing, extremely nonlinear in its functions, and that chaos probably pa plays a role. So those are the three key, you know, empirical issues, and they're all you can't buy in into them. It's a matter of hoping they are true. It's an open scientific question.